Our core belief for today is worship. We believe when we come together in worship to God, we offer prayer, praise, and thanks, and continue to learn, and understand, and apply God's word. Thank you. It's nice to know. Can you hear me? There we go. So you're cheating on me with other sermons, huh? I see how it is. No, it sounds good. I'll have to look that up. Well, good morning. Glad to see you guys here today. Um, grateful for each of you and for what God is just doing in this community and in our, uh, our immediate world. I know... I hear a lot, so you guys don't hear as much, but I hear so many different things from each individual lives, things that are going well, things that are going difficult, things that are challenging. We have several people that are in some real health situations right now. We need to keep praying. Uh, we have some who have pulled through and things are doing better. Good to see you guys and uh, hear the good news with your boy. And So just continue to pray. we got those prayer things. I guess I just want to bring that up to say, as we're praying for the, the world and the nation and all that, uh, let's be praying for each other. Let's be showing up in each other's lives. Be, be a people who are not just people who attend church together, but a people who are the church together, right? It's a whole different thing. It's one thing to say, hey, I attend church at Northside. It's different to say, that's my people. And the only way we make that transition is by showing up, and by being a part. And so I encourage you as much as possible. I know not everybody can't be at everything, and that's fine. There's no expectation for you to be at everything. But if you can be at the Wednesday nights, if you can be at the men's breakfast, if you can be at the ladies' events, if you can show up for the meals and the things like that, that's the things that, that turn this. If you can be inviting today, invite somebody to go out to lunch with you. Say, hey, I know we've briefly met, we've never hung out, we're grabbing lunch, would you like to go? Those are the things that kind of turn us from being attenders to being family and, and really growing closer together. So I just want to encourage you to do that and be praying for one another as well. We're going to continue walking through Proverbs uh, today, some different topics in Proverbs. I uh, got some good feedback from the a couple of messages on resources and on wealth and on money, and hopefully that was encouraging and challenging to you and has shaped a little bit of how we use our resources. I know this last week there were some things I needed, and I, uh, and I was ordering those online. And while, you know, when you're ordering things online, they always try to, like, shove other things, like, oh, you might also like this. You might also like that. You're like, ooh, maybe I would like that as well. Uh, and, but I, but I, I did. I actually had that thought. I'm ordering some things I needed, and they showed me some things I didn't need, but it would be really cool to have. And I thought, oh, I could get that. But no, that's an emotional response. It's an emotional spending response, not a spiritual one. And I had to check my own heart. I'm like, all right, God, you're, you're speaking to me what you were speaking through me. And, and I, I did not spend that money. So I got one little victory under my belt. Hopefully you got a few as well. Today I want to talk to you about your reputation. About our reputations. If I said, think of a historical character who is known for their honesty, who's the first person that comes to mind? Abraham Lincoln, right? Honest Abe. Honest Abe. He's known, his integrity, his honesty kind of defined who he was. If I said that you're a Benedict Arnold, what does that mean? You're a traitor, right? I have no idea who Benedict Arnold really was. I learned a little bit. He was in... Uh, he went to West Point, he commanded, he, he turned over the U.S. post at West Point in return for some money and power in the British Army. Uh, but I, he probably lived a really great life up to that point. He probably did all kinds of great things before that. He was probably all, but what do we know? That one action it defines his character. Now, anytime you call somebody a Benedict Arnold, you automatically think traitor. His reputation. If I say that your name is Mud, did you know that Mud is an actual person? If you say somebody's name is Mud, that's actually referring to Samuel Mud, who was a physician convicted for conspiring with John Wilkes Booth to assassinate Lincoln. So your name is Mud. His name is actually Mud. 
His reputation ruined his name. And it's not just that it's beyond. If Albert Einstein, you're, you're such an Einstein. Right? What does that mean? It means you're intelligent. You're extremely smart. Wow, you're an Einstein. And there's so many people like that where we just say their name and we have an automatic association with their character, with something about who they are. Names can be so much more than just a reference to a person. Depending on how that person lived, a name can bring up all kinds of emotions. If you call somebody a narcissist or say that a task is Herculean, those are both names referred to in Greek mythology. Their names took on the, the aspects of their character. Let's make it a little more personal. If I were to sit down with you and say, tell me what you think about your father. Tell me what you, what you feel about your mother. You may think of words like loving, strong, funny, caring, self-sacrificial. I think every funeral I've done, when they describe who the person is, every single time they say, but they were stubborn. I don't think I've ever been to a funeral where they didn't say they were a little bit stubborn. Maybe that's just part of who we are. Of course, if I say, tell me about your mom or your dad, maybe you think of words like harsh, neglectful, angry, bitter, abusive. Those names can draw out of us not just memories but emotions depending on the character of the people we're thinking about. My guess is though if I ask you to describe your mom or your dad or some other loved one to me, it would take a little while before you got to their profession. It would take you a little while, we said, they were a bricklayer, or they were a school teacher, unless their profession defined their character. Why? Because it's, it's that, that saying that people will always remember, they may not remember what you did or what you said, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Our character, our reputation impacts people around us. The lives they lead cause us to look at them and feel differently about them depending on who they were. If somebody thinks about you, what would they say? If I had your kid come up here, what would they say? If I had your coworkers, your neighbors, your family members, your friends, and I asked them, describe to me who they were, what would they say? It's a good exercise to walk through mentally to say, when I die, what do I want people to say about me? And is that true of who I am today? And if not, what do I need to do to become that? We talked these last few weeks about the blessings and the dangers of wealth, but Proverbs tells us there's something you can possess that's even greater than your money or your possessions, or your wealth. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name is to be chosen. And I love a few things about that. One, it puts our priorities in the right spot, right? It, it keeps our priorities, and we're going to talk all through a bunch of this stuff, saying what does it mean that I have a good name, and that should be something we value. But it's interesting to me, it says a good name should be chosen rather than wealth. Over and over and over again, in a hundred little tiny ways, we have the ability to choose to choose what we value. And our decisions can turn us one direction or another. Steve Jobs, how many guys, anybody does not know who Steve Jobs is? You have no idea who Steve Jobs is. Curiosity. Okay, he started Apple, right? He was the one that created Apple. Multi-billionaire, changed the world with the iPhone. Literally changed, changed the way that humans interact and think and process via the iPhone and the, the app store. He was brilliant. Created, he's got a long list of things he created that, or he helped 
create. But when he died from cancer, over and over and over again, you know what was most often said about him? He was a jerk. He was brilliant. Brilliant. He accomplished incredible things. And he was a total jerk. And that was his reputation. He chose over and over and over again through his life, with his family, with his co-workers, with his business, he chose progress and profit over people every time. Did he accomplish a lot? He sure did, but at what cost? His memory was not a memory of somebody who was a loving father. His memory was not a memory of someone who was a great husband. His memory is not a memory of somebody who was a good friend or who was a philanthropist who did good things and made the world a better place. Because he chose over and over and over again. The word good here this, in this verse, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. The word good is actually... Uh, added, it's not in the original Hebrew, to give us some context to help us understand it better. It says that a name is to be chosen. That we should, we should choose to have a name. A name that is known, a name that is recognized, a name that means something to somebody is a decision that should be a priority in our lives. Now it's interesting that Solomon wrote this. Solomon's the richest man alive. He's also the most famous person in the land. He rubs shoulders every day from his position as king with the wealthy and the influential, with the powerful, with the popular. That's his people. He grew up in the palace. He had an inside view on this from the earliest times of what those decisions look like to choose wealth or to choose a good name. To choose power or to choose a good name. Now I'm not sure if there's a connection here or not, but in my mind it makes sense. I think of young Solomon sitting at the side of his father David. And David is telling him stories of his life. He's telling him the stories of how, how he came to power, how he came to become king. The stories of when he was anointed as king and all that happened as, as a kid he was anointed and all the things that happened to, king, to David before he became king. And one of those stories that he would have had to tell his son was the story of Saul. And Saul is a warning for us for those who choose power, who choose wealth, who choose authority rather than choosing to have a good name. Over and over and over again, Saul would choose the things that would benefit him and not the things that would care for others. He would choose to do things his way and not the way that God told him to do it. Even near the end, as David came, young David came to serve King Saul, play the heart for him, he would throw the spear at him because he was threatened by his presence. I wonder if David told the stories of Saul trying to protect his power and wealth. As David grew in reputation, Saul desperately tried to hold on to power. Do you remember the little chant that the people would say as they came back from war? Saul has killed his thousands. David is tens of thousands. David was not concerned from what we can see. He didn't have much of a concern for his reputation in terms of making himself look good. But he gathered those who were pushed aside by Saul and he gave them a place to belong. He served the Lord humbly and he went to battle and he did, he did what he could do to serve God and in the, in the mission that God had given him. And as a result of caring more for that than he did for himself, he began to build a reputation. I wonder if he shared these stories with the young Solomon. Maybe Solomon grew up listening to those stories about Dave, Saul's lust for power and wealth and David's desire to be a man after God's own heart. He says something similar in Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, 7. It says, The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. Some of you know that in your own lives. 
You have family members whose names that you think of them, and you are blessed by that thought. You think of them and you say, man, I miss them. You can think of somebody right now, you're like, I wish they were here. I would love to hang out with them. They're an encouragement. They are a blessing. They were, they were so special to me. Just one more chance to sit with them, what I would give. And there might be others who you think of their name. And immediately all of the negative things roll back up again. The anger, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the pain, the betrayals. Their name causes a rot in those who remember them. He writes something very similar in Ecclesiastes 7. It says, A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death better than the day of birth. My dad mentioned this a few weeks back when he preached. The day of death is better than the day of birth. How can that be true? It's true when we have a good name. When our lives have been such an impact and such a blessing. When we have served others and cared for others. When the way that we have lived has, has caused others to breathe easier and to walk lighter and to feel more loved. In that moment when we pass, there is a rejoicing for who we were and a desire for others to be more like us. Wouldn't you love for that to be true? That if someday... Somebody can look at uh, their loved one and say, their kids say, you need to be like them. Look at their life. Look at the example that they set. Look at the way that they lived. Look at the way that they served. Look at the way that they loved. Look at the way that they gave. Look at who they were and model yourself after them because their name is a blessing. It's a celebration. We don't... We don't feel like having a reputation, I, at least from my experience in the church, uh, it feels like we downplay the idea of having a good reputation in front of people. Like, only care what God thinks about you. Don't care at all what people think about you. It sounds right, right? It sounds like I could get up here and say that, and it feels like, yeah, only care about what God thinks about you. But that's not what Scripture teaches. We should be very aware and very concerned with how others see us, with our reputation. Why is that? So humans, as humans, we tend to, towards one of two extremes with just about everything in life, and it's no different when it comes to reputation. And in almost everything, we tend towards a selfish extreme. And in my experience, people fall in two categories when it comes to reputation. Uh, they, they fall into, either they do everything filtered through this idea of what will people think about me. And the reputation is the foundation of their identity. They follow the crowd, they're terrified to stand out or disagree because what if people don't like me anymore? I can't stand up for what I believe in. I can't stand out from the crowd. I can't go against people that, that I that care. I have to do whatever others want me to do because I'm so concerned with what others think about me. My identity is wrapped up in their opinion of me. And if they don't like me, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or the other extreme is I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to live my life however I want to live it, and you can like it or not, I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. Both of those are ultimately selfish positions. And both of those go against what Scripture teaches us. Neither one of them puts us in a position to truly care for somebody else. On one side, we're using people for our own self-validation. We don't really care about them to the point where others could be walking into danger or making poor decisions with their life, and we will support their poor decisions because we're afraid they may not like us if we stand against them. That's selfishness. You can't care about somebody if you're not willing to stand up and speak truth and risk the fact that they might not like what you say. If I do whatever I want and I don't care what others think about me, well, then I'm going to be a terrible friend. I'm going to be a terrible neighbor. 
Anybody have a neighbor like that? Don't raise your hand. Who doesn't care what you think, and they're going to do whatever they want because they can. Well, maybe technically that's true, but it still makes you a horrible person. You have the right to be selfish and terrible. You have the right to stand up in a, in a movie theater and annoy the fire out of everybody. There's consequences, but you can do it. You have the right to just be confrontational and argumentative with everybody you come in contact with. You have the right to be a jerk. But it's not right to be a jerk. In place of community, if we live in this way that says, I don't care what anybody thinks about me, we become the divisive ones. So if I'm so caught up in what others think I, that I never step up or I never stand out, I can't speak difficult truths into, into comfortable lies. And I'll never be iron sharpening iron. And if I'm always concerned about myself, then I'm never going to be willing to step into somebody else's life and help them and serve them and take care of them and look out for others' well-being over my own. In both of these places, I find myself standing against the Word of God and against the ways that love and serve and care for others. So how then should we live? Scripture, of course, teaches a better way. What does the Bible teach us about having a good name? About how to prioritize the value of a good reputation without getting lost in others' opinions of us? If you have your Bibles, open to 1 Peter 2. I think 1 Peter, or when Peter writes this, he does a really good job of threading this needle of, of walking between these two ditches, of saying, how then should we live as people who know our reputation matters but refuse to get caught up in the opinions of others? 1 Peter 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans, those who don't believe, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, rather the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Verse 20, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you as an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. There's so much to unpack in that little portion, and we're not going to get to all of it. Why should we care about our reputation? Verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They would glorify God because they see the lives we live. We're called to point others to Christ. That is the grand purpose of our lives. There's all kinds of sub purposes, there's all kinds of other purposes, but the grand purpose of your life, the reason that you are here, the reason that Christ has saved you is one, because he loves you, and two, because he wants you to represent him in the world around you. And we can't do that with a poor reputation. It's interesting, it says here that we can live a great Christian life and we will still be accused of wrongdoing. So just, this is, this is where that balance is, right? We don't just do whatever makes people happy. We do what's right. And if they hate it, we still do what's right. And if, and if they 
get mad and they get angry and they get this is interesting to me because Jesus obviously lived a perfect life and clearly everybody loved Jesus right when he walked around nobody had any issues with him did they well, yeah they had a lot of issues with Jesus he ticked off a lot of people he lived the most perfect life that is po he was absolutely perfect and he ticked off all kinds of people Everybody at some point was frustrated with Jesus because he didn't line up with their values. He established new values. The government was ticked off at Jesus. The, the Pharisees were ticked off with Jesus. Even his followers at one point, they're all like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, and a whole bunch of them left. His own disciples, right? It wasn't a ringing endorsement. They're like, well, where else are we going to go? Like, we don't really know what's going on right now, but... You've got the words of life, so I guess we'll stick with you. Jesus lived perfectly, and there's a lot of people. He was killed. But our value system as followers of Christ, we've got to understand, it will put us at odds with others. Because we should love things that the world hates. We should hate things that the world loves. In John 15, 8, Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. We don't use that verse very often when it comes to evangelism. Come to Jesus and everybody will hate you. Who wants to sign up? But he says, If the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, you would, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Verse 22 says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. So because Jesus lived such a righteous life, those who were convicted of their sin either humbled themselves and followed him, or they hated him for it. And he says the same is true. If you walk as my people... You're going to impact the world around you, and there's going to be one of two choices. They're going to get mad and frustrated because your good works expose their evil, or they're going to understand that their lives are lived evil and humble themselves and worship God. And those are the responses that we're going to get. You say, that doesn't sound like having a great reputation, does it? But if you really walk the way of Christ will first be personally convicted of our sin. And then our new life will likely convict others of their sin as well. You don't drink like you used to. You don't put up with gossip when everybody else is gossiping. You won't lie to cover for them. You're no longer living in lust. You stop listening to music that promotes ungodly values. You don't go to the places that your old friends used to go. You don't say the things your old friends still say. You don't do what they did. And there's a conviction that has to happen when you no longer live the way of the world. Now it's important to note that Peter says that even though they were accused of doing wrong, their lives were so full of good deeds that even the accusers had to ultimately give glory to God. If you're disliked, if I'm disliked because we're arrogant and we're self-righteous, that is not being Christ-like. We're like, oh, I'm better than you. I don't do those things anymore. You know, are you sinner? How dare you do that? Don't you know that, that you could be like me? I'm, that's a pharisaical way to, to live, right? That's the Pharisees standing on the corner saying, God, thank you that I'm not like the sinners. It's the opposite. But if we live in such a way that our good works, actually, they would be challenged and convicted by our lives, but our good works will stack up in such a way they say, look, I don't like it because it makes me feel uncomfortable, but look at the way they live. Look at the way they love. Look at the way they forgive. Look at the way they serve. Look at the joy in their life. Look at the peace in their life. Look at how when everything else is shaking, we talked about this morning, they stand secure. Their good works stack up so much that even though their lives convict me, I have to acknowledge there's something different about them. There's something 
different about the way they live. They don't just talk about Jesus. They don't just show up at church. They live different. The good name that God calls us to is one that is willing to separate from the crowd and yet serve them as well. It also shows that our first priority should be our reputation before God. In Luke 2, it says that Jesus grew in favor with who? It says he grew in favor with, somebody say it, who was it? God and man. He grew in favor with God and man. He didn't say, it doesn't just say Jesus grew in favor with God and man can deal with it. Both of those. As he grew in favor with God, his reputation amongst those around him also began to be changed and, and influenced. What is your reputation before God? David was clearly far from perfect. Murder, adultery, amongst other things. But his repentance and his change were so genuine that he was called a man after God's own heart. Paul held the coats of the people that murdered the early Christians. But he repented and he changed and he lived in such a way that in Acts 24 says, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. First, favor with God. And as a result, we become more like him. And then we live in such a way that we grow in favor with man. 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Both of these things are true. And they should shape how we live. God looks at your heart. You can fake me out. You all look nice today. You look good. You're dressed up. Most of you are smiling. Most of you are still awake. It's good. You all look good. You can fool me because I look at you. I'm like, I want to be like them when I grow up. You get, these guys are amazing. You got it together. Your lives are going so well. You're looking good. You're feeling good. You can fool me. I can fool you. Because we look on the outward, but we can't fool God. God's not sitting here looking at you going, you know, that's a nice outfit today. You must be doing really well. He sees your heart. He says, I know where you're struggling. And I know what you're hiding. And I know what you're battling. And I know where you're struggling. I see past the outside and I see your heart. When our heart is lived authentic before God, not perfect, not perfect, none of us are, but authentic and humble and obedient before God. It will change who we are. And then it says, man looks on the outside. That is the secondary response. Jesus grew in favor with God and man. Paul says, I want a clear conscience between God and, and man. When we live righteous and open and holy and transparent before God, it changes how we live and the reputation changes as a result. You don't have to run around trying to be holy, trying to have a good reputation, trying to influence others, trying. You don't have to go through all of the effort and the work and, and the stress. And oh, If you're authentic before God, you will authentically change before others. It's the natural result of a heart that is in love with the Lord. Os Guinness, who is a fantastic writer in his book, Fool's Talk, said this. He said, to follow Jesus is to pay the cost of discipleship and then to die to ourselves, to our own interests, to our own agendas and reputations. To follow Jesus is to pick up our crosses and count the cost of losing all that contradicts his will and his way, including our reputation before the world and our standing with the people and in the communities that we once held dear. Dear. It is to live before one audience, the audience of one, and therefore to die to all other conflicting opinions and assessments. 
It's a transformation that happens in our lives when we become not just believers, but followers of Christ. I think that's an important distinction in, in our world today. I think there's a lot of people in our world, the majority of people in America, or the vast majority of people in America will say that they are Christian. But there's a whole, whole other thing. It says, maybe you're a believer, but are you a follower of Christ? When that happens, then the reputation changes. Our reputation reflects our character. Our character impacts how we treat others. And how we treat others represents the love of God for them and gives us open doors and opportunities to be a people of influence. Why should we care about our reputation? Because you and I are called to be a people of influence. To be a people that make a difference. And if my reputation and your reputation is mud, we will have no good influence on those who need it the most. 2 Corinthians 6.3 says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. If we're not walking in authenticity and obedience to the Lord, we become the stumbling block that keeps others from seeing Jesus. We become the, the obstacle that stands between others and Christ. We all know, and maybe some of you have been the people who said, you know what? I don't know if I can follow Jesus because I've had encounters with Jesus followers. I've had encounters with Christians and it was really negative and hateful and spiteful and judgmental and whatever else. And I don't know if I can follow Jesus. If that's what it looks like to follow Jesus, that's not what I want. It's the famous quote by Gandhi that says, you're Jesus I love, it's your Christians I'm not too sure about. Would you bow your heads with me? A quote I've shared in the past from Brendan Manning says, The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. If we forfeit our influence by not caring what others think, it can be just as tragic as forfeiting our influence by compromising our faith to gain their approval. We should be aware of our reputation. Not so that we get glory, not so that we are loved, but so that we can be bridge builders. You are called to make a difference in your world. You may never be on a stage. You may never be able to talk to dozens or hundreds or thousands of people, but there is somebody in your life that you are called to be an influence in. Your reputation will draw people towards the Lord or will push people away. We endeavor to live lives that are so good that even though others are convicted, they can't help but glorify God. They can't help but see the love and the goodness and the power of God at work in our lives. Your reputation matters. What is your reputation? Have you thought of yourself as an ambassador have you thought of yourself as a missionary? Because if you're a follower of God and you walk in any environment that has unbelievers in it, you are a missionary in that place. And your reputation matters. 
with every, everybody's head bowed and their eyes closed just so we can let this be a personal moment. Uh, the, the two questions I have is, first of all, maybe you are far from God. Maybe you say, I'm not a believer. I'm not a follower of Jesus. I haven't submitted my life to Christ, but I can't do this on my own. I want him to forgive my sins. I need to submit to his rule and his reign. I want to follow Jesus today. I want to become a true follower of Christ. That's you today. Understand that Jesus says that if you will call out to him, he will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. You will be set free. The old is gone. Something brand new will come. There is a new creation. You will come alive. If you are not a follower of Christ and today you choose to follow, you will come alive. You will be forgiven. You will be free. You will find purpose if you're willing to submit your life to Jesus. If that's you today, say, I want to become a follower of Jesus today. My old life is gone and I want a new life in Christ. Would you just raise a hand? I want to pray for you. Just raise a hand if that's you. So I'm going to give up my old ways and I want to follow his. If you're online, please reach out to us. Send us a message. Give us a call. We'd love to pray for you. Maybe you're in here today, and as we're talking about reputation, you realize that your character has not built the reputation that Christ has called you to. Maybe your anger, maybe your bitterness, maybe whatever that list is, but the character of your life hasn't really established you as the, the person that others would look at and say, I want to follow Christ because of the way they follow Christ. Your influence in others has not been the kind of influence that makes others glorify the Father in heaven. And you say, know what? The Holy Spirit's convicting me today. There's an aspect, there's an area, there's something in my life that is causing me to be someone who's burning bridges and not building them. And I want to change. The Lord's convicting you of that. Could we just pray? Would you lift that up to him? Would you ask forgiveness? Maybe you've been a person who doesn't care what anybody thinks and that's ostracized you from people. Maybe you've been a person who cares so much what others think that you've not been able to stand up for righteousness and you've caught yourself in situations where you're compromised. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today? Would you speak to our hearts today? We acknowledge our imperfection. We acknowledge the fact that we don't measure up. We're not good enough. We can't be. But by your grace, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can be a people who are people of influence, who stand strong against the wickedness of the world, but also stand lovingly, reaching out to those who are far from you. That our good deeds would create a reputation for a good God. The others would look at us and say, I don't know what it is, but I want to be more like you. Your love, your patience, your joy, your confidence. It's something the world doesn't offer. Where do I find that? And we can be a people that points others to you. Let me show you my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about my brokenness and how I was not who I am, but God stepped in and now I can be different and this can be true for you too. Empower us to be missionaries. 
commission us to be missionaries to our workplaces, to be missionaries to our neighborhoods, to be missionaries to our families. May our reputation bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.